Yesterday, we talked about Alexander Hamilton, one of the Federalist authors who wrote Federalist Number 1. This was an essay that went out across early American newspapers to try to convince many of the fellow citizens of the new country to unify, to ratify the new Constitution. And in his first essay, he gives us six different reasons why or six different areas of topics that he's going to be covering in remaining essays. We talked about those yesterday, but the main crux of his argument was this, join or die. There was a very, very highly concerted effort to convince many people in early America to join or else their future would be destroyed. And several of the Federalists who were behind these arguments were, of course, John Jay. We have Alexander Hamilton. He wrote number one. And then we have James Madison. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about James Madison. Many people consider him to be sort of the father of the Constitution. But over on the anti-Federalist side, there were people who were opposing their arguments. And so there was this grand debate taking place. Every time one of the Federalists would come up with an argument, the Anti-Federalists would come up with an argument. And so these were people like George Mason. We have Patrick Henry and we have Samuel Adams. Now, because these people were a little bit less uh, in favor of organization and centralization, a lot of their documents are a little bit less organized. And so they're kind of scattered and a lot of data is actually lost to history. We don't know who exactly some of the authors are, specifically who, what, you know, which one of these founding fathers actually drafted it. But today we're gonna to go with George Mason as one of the anti-federalists. And so this is being written under a pen name of John DeWitt. And this was published to the free citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts way back early in 1787, right in Massachusetts. And so DeWitt writes, whoever attentively examines the history of America and compares it with that of other will find its commencement, its growth, and its present situation without a precedent. What's happening here in America is pretty amazing, he says. And so we've been thinking through a lot of the issues that have been taking place in this new land. And we just had a convention, a convention from the different states has been convened by the most respectable citizens, and respectable indeed, I may say, for their equity, for their literature, and for their love of their country. They went to the Constitutional Convention, and now their proceedings, what came out of that Constitutional Convention, this new Constitution that we're supposed to consider, is before us. The eagerness with which they have been received by certain classes of our fellow citizens naturally forces upon us this question. Are we to adopt this government without an examination? Some there are who, literally speaking, are for pressing it upon us at all events. Everywhere we go, they keep talking about this new constitution. The name of the man who but lisps a sentiment in objection to this, somebody who just slightly disagrees, is to be handed to the printer. The printer is going to publish his name, make it public, and by the public, he is going to be executed. Anybody who speaks out is led to the chopping block. He says they are themselves stabbing its reputation. For my part, personally, I am a stranger to the necessity for all this haste. What's the hurry? Why are we rushing through this? Is it not a subject of some small importance? Certainly it is. Are not your lives, your liberties, and properties intimately involved in it? Certainly they are. Is it a government for a moment, a day, or a year? By no means, but for ages. Altered it may be, but it is easier to correct before it is adopted. We should get it right now, not later. Is it for a family, a state, or a small number of people? It is for a number no less respectable than three millions. It's for a gigantic population. And we should slow down, is what DeWitt is saying. He says there are many people out there, we're told by some, that upon the adopting of this new government, we are to become everything in a moment. Our foreign and domestic debts will be as a feather. Our ports will be crowded with the ships of all the world, soliciting our commerce and our produce. Our manufacturers will increase and multiply. And in short, if we stand still, our country notwithstanding will be like the blessed Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. Let us not deceive ourselves. 
The only excellency of any government is in exact proportion to the administration of it. Idleness and luxury will be as much a bane as ever. Our passions will be equally at war with us then as now. And if we have men among us trying with all their ability to undermine our present constitution, these very persons will direct their force to sap the vitals of the new one. He says, it is the duty of everyone in this commonwealth to communicate his sentiments to his neighbor, divested of passion and equally so of prejudices. If they are honest and he is a real friend of this country. He will do it and embrace every opportunity to do it. If thoroughly looked into before it is adopted, the people will be more apt to approve of it in practice. And every man is a traitor to himself and his posterity who shall ratify it with his signature without first endeavoring to understand it. The people who read it and sign it, we can rely on. The people who sign it without reading it are traitors. We are but yet in its infancy, and we had better proceed slow than too fast. It is much easier to dispense powers than to recall them. The present generation will not be drawn into any system. They are too enlightened. They have not forfeited their right to a share in government, and they ought to enjoy it. Don't give up your liberties. Once we dispense powers, once we give the bureaucrats leverage, we can never recall them. He says, listen, everybody, upon the whole, my fellow countrymen, I am as much a federal man as any person. In a federal union lies our political salvation to preserve that union and to make it a respectable to foreign optics. The national government ought to be armed with all necessary powers, but the subject I conceive of infinite delicacy and requires both ability and reflection. In discussing points of such moment, America has nothing to do with passions or hard words. Every American has an undoubted right to examine for himself. Neither ought he to be ill-treated and abused because he does not think at the same moment exactly as we do. Don't belittle your fellow countrymen for disagreeing. Sit down, eliminate the emotion and the vitriol, and talk the issues through. Because if we aggressively dispense with powers, we will never get those back. That is John DeWitt, Anti-Federalist number one. I'll see you tomorrow.